When you look at the Thurman Dam today, it's easy to be impressed by its size. And somehow, like looking up at a mountain, it seems as if it's always been there. You think about it, but not too much. Like the electricity it produces, that's always right there in the wall socket. Your peace of mind is just what the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was mandated to provide when Congress passed the Flood Control Act of 1944. And we began work in August of 1946 on what was then called the Clark Hill Dam. The Clark Hill Dam, located on the Savannah River, 22 miles upstream from Augusta, Georgia. Clark Hill was the first of three dams constructed on the Savannah by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as part of the Savannah River Basin Development Plan, an ambitious concept created in response to the congressional mandate for flood control. By building dams that were not just levees and dikes, but hydroelectric power plants, the force of the river could produce electricity, safe, clean, renewable, economical, and plentiful for the people of the region. All of this meant jobs and economic opportunity for people living in and around the 10,000 square mile Savannah River watershed. Construction of the Clark Hill Dam began at a time when our nation was converting huge resources from World War II to peace. This massive endeavor of mind and machine was completed in 1954 after only eight years at a cost of what was then, and now, an astonishing $79 million. Constructed to hold back the forces of nature, alleviating thousands of dollars of annual flood damage in the valley below. The cost of construction would have been much higher if suitable granite had not been discovered within a mile of the site on the Georgia side of the Savannah River. The largest blast used over 11,000 pounds of explosives. Blasting over two million tons of granite from the earth was the first step in an amazing and elaborate system of rock crushers, conveyor belts, and storage piles that stretched nearly half a mile. This labyrinth of rock piles and heavy equipment was known as the aggregate production line, where all the aggregate or ingredients for concrete were made from scratch and set aside till needed. Trucks from the quarry dropped boulders into the primary crushing unit at one end. The boulders were smashed into rocks six inches or smaller in diameter. Anything larger was sent through again. Secondary crushers turned rocks into stones and stones into pebbles. In order to classify each ingredient of the aggregate, all of it was rapidly sifted and sorted through screens of various and specific sizes, then conveyed to huge storage piles, one for each size classification. The granite was even pulverized into sand in one part of the operation called the rod mill. As the sand emerged from the rod mill, it was pumped to the sand classifier. The washed and classified sand was then conveyed to the sand storage piles, the lifeblood of the concrete mixing plant. The other necessary ingredients for concrete, Portland and natural cement, were stored in huge silos. This aggregate production line created all the material needed to make every cubic inch of the 1,050,000 cubic yards of concrete used in construction of the dam. At the far end of the production line, the aggregate was mixed into concrete following exact U.S. Army Corps of Engineers specifications at a rate of 240 cubic yards per hour, 24 hours a day. All concrete mixing was handled through an automatic control board located in the mixing plant. Each batch went through a predetermined mixing cycle and was then dumped into the waiting bucket below. Concrete mixing is a science. Nothing was left to chance. An ice manufacturing plant was also located at the mixing plant. Ice was manufactured to add to the mix during warm weather in place of water in order to maintain proper temperature during placement. 
as concrete that is placed too hot or too cold may cause considerable trouble during the curing period. Construction of the dam began by creating the enormous earth embankment approaches, which are 880 feet wide at the base, 45 feet wide on top, half a mile long, and 155 feet above the old floodplain. This required 3.3 million cubic yards of earth fill to be dug out from the future lake bed upstream, moved into place and layered, graded, and compacted. Then the real work began. Manhandling the river, changing its course. In order to begin construction on the concrete section of the dam, a dredge was brought in to carve a new channel for the river. Stage one encircled the area where the concrete foundation was to be placed by interlocking steel plates to create a giant watertight horseshoe-shaped coffer dam that extended well into the river on the Georgia side. The water was then pumped out from inside the enclosure to expose the riverbed, which was blasted away down to bedrock. The coffer dam allowed heavy equipment to operate 15 to 30 feet below the normal water level. Core samples were taken and all unsuitable rock was washed away so the concrete foundation could be anchored to stable bedrock. A railway trestle was constructed out over the foundation site so a locomotive could move the wet concrete from the mixing plant to the 50-ton gantry crane for placement by the crew. The gantry crane had a 125-foot boom, which enabled it to reach any part of the construction site where concrete was needed. The concrete section of the dam was built in a series of alternate blocks, or monoliths, in order to allow use of cantilever forms and permit shrinkage of the concrete. Each block, or monolith, was constructed in lifts five feet deep, 12 to 62 feet wide, and up to 150 feet long. As each lift was completed, it was cured and allowed to set. The forms were then removed and reassembled for the next lift. By the time first stage construction was finished, 272,000 cubic yards of concrete had been poured on the Georgia side of the river. Stage two repeated the same procedure across the river. The coffer dam was dismantled and rebuilt on the South Carolina side, and the arduous task of exposing solid bedrock began again. With stage two underway, construction of the powerhouse foundation could begin. Construction of the powerhouse was extremely complex since the pieces that make up the huge generating units needed to be installed in their final position as the concrete building around them was forming. Thus the installation of the scroll casings that house the turbines was begun well before the building substructure was finished. The seven huge penstock tubes, each 20 feet in diameter, that feed water to the turbines in the powerhouse were bolted together plate by plate and attached to the scroll casings. Riveting crews followed and riveted the plates together. The concrete section was now almost one half mile in length. A total of 680,000 cubic yards of concrete had now been placed. 282,000 yards in the spillway, 408,000 yards in the intake section for the powerhouse. The structure was now 200 feet high from foundation to roadway. The third, or closing phase, shut off the water flow between the low blocks in the middle of the river and the lake began to rise. Preparation of the future lake bed was going on all the while, harvesting trees that could be underwater hazards and turning them into lumber products, provided jobs and kept local sawmills busy. Residents of the area were relocated to higher ground. 
The seven original generating units were supplied by General Electric, and each was designed to output 40 megawatts, or 40 million watts. The huge rotors were assembled on site. They're made of thousands of steel plates called punchings, stacked to form the rim of each of the 207 ton rotors. The punchings were carefully weighed before they were placed around the rim to ensure proper balance and prevent vibration when all 207 tons started spinning to generate voltage. The original turbines were supplied by the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company. Each was designed to produce 55,000 horsepower using 17 buckets and 24 wicket gates to get the job done. The final step was to enclose the generator units in airtight housings to provide cooling and fire protection. It took just two months for the lake to fill up and become the largest reservoir ever created by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers east of the Mississippi River. The first main generating unit began operation in 1952 and the completed Clark Hill powerhouse came online in 1954 with a yearly power output of 698 million kilowatt hours. In 1988, it was renamed for South Carolina Senator J. Strom Thurmond. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers not only built the dam, but over the years has maintained and operated all aspects of the power plant, dam, and lake, and welcomes millions of visitors each year. Welcome to the J. Strom Thurmond Dam and Power Plant. The dam was completed in 1954, and it's over a mile long. There's enough concrete in the dam to build a sidewalk from Augusta, Georgia, all the way to San Francisco. The lake behind the dam has over 1,200 miles of shoreline to play on. The nerve center of the power plant is the control room. Everything is controlled from here. Here in the control room, I monitor the controls of the generating units and transformer operation and what we put out on the line from the switchyard. We coordinate with the Southeastern Power Administration. We coordinate also with the power companies. As an operator, I must be able to operate the plant manually. However, computers have provided us the ability to operate the plant through automation. The human element is still there. Someone is here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Seven stories below the control room is the penstock gallery. This is where the water comes in from the lake. It's the first step in creating hydroelectric power. The penstock gallery is the lowest point in the powerhouse which is about 150 feet below the surface of the lake. And we have seven pin stock, one for each unit. Pin stock is 20 foot in diameter, and it's large enough that you could drive a school bus through it without really touching the top or the side of it. In full operation, each pin stock delivers approximately 37,000 gallons of water per second. This is enough to fill an Olympic swimming pool within three seconds. And the pressure of the water through the pen stock allowed the turbine to turn. On the level above the pen stock gallery are the turbines. My job is a hydro mechanic. My job is to make sure that the seven generators that we have here is running at all times to produce electricity. We have to give praise to our units, but we do have repair. And, uh, when it's broken, we fix it. That's our job. Here at the Thurman Power Plant, I'm a, what they call an A electrician journeyman. I maintain all the electrical aspects of the power plant. Generator, transformer, switchyard. As we go around to the side here, down in the alcove, this is the shaft that connects the turbine and the generator. It weighs approximately 63,000 pounds. So you can see that this is some very heavy equipment. The shaft itself 
on the top part of it is connected to the generator and uh, the lower part is connected to the turbine. So when the turbine moves, the generator is going to move with it also. This is the rotating component here in what we call the bearing housing. This is the rotor itself inside the generator. Now that's going to create a magnetic field to induce a voltage. On the level above the turbines are the generators. And here on the generator floor, which is approximately 500 feet long, 60 feet wide, and 70 feet tall, are the seven main power generators used to produce power from the power plant. For the first 40 years, the project was very pristine, clean, uh, in order. We have a major rehab program going on where the generators are being rewound, the turbines are being replaced. In order for that to happen, the contractors are on site, units are taken apart, and pieces are scattered from here, yonder, and everywhere. The guys working on the big rotor are taking the field poles off for re-insulation. Uh, each rotor weighs 207 tons. Each rotor has 72 poles. And that is the rotating magnetic field used in the generation of electricity. The largest load in the plant is a 207-ton rotor. We have a bridge crane capable of lifting 225 tons to do that work. The crane travels the entire length of the power plant and is able to reach all parts of the generator for disassembly and reassembly. I'm the power project manager uh, responsible for the operations and maintenance of the power plant. There are three functions within the project, natural resources, park operations, and hydropower. And I'm responsible for the hydropower section. We have seven generators, and in one hour, one generator can produce enough power for 216 homes for an entire year. The rehab program is based on uh, reliability, efficiency, capacity. Originally the turbines were operating at 92 percent efficient. The test results indicated they were, had dropped down to 88 percent efficient. So that justified replacing the turbine runners. As a result of that, our generators can be rewound from 40 megawatt units, which is 40 million watts, to 52 megawatt units, or 52 million watts each. 52 million divided by 100 equals a number of 100 watt light bulbs that big. So you do the math. Now, how they upgraded it is that you have to use larger conductors. And those conductors are what we call coils that's in the stator. So to, to get more power out of them, we used a larger piece of copper and better insulation. That way, the units can produce more power on demand when it's needed by the uh, general public. Certain periods of year, the DO levels, dissolved oxygen levels downstream, are, are not what we would like them to be. In order to increase the DO levels, we're replacing our turbine runners with aerated runners and it allows us to um, mix air into the discharge water to improve those levels. That way the fish uh, downstream can survive much better than they are now. They are more happy. <laughs> when we're not generating power there's normally no release. We have two small station service generators that are used as backup for our in-house power but if we're not generating with those station service units there's no release of water. New technology has made other changes and upgrades possible throughout the powerhouse and switchyard. Changes such as dial meters to digital meters. Static excitation is now in use in order to excite and regulate voltage from the seven main generating units and provides a quicker response than the old rotary devices used in the past. Okay, I noticed we got some lights out here on your nunciator panel. The governors, which control the speed of the generating units, are also being upgraded from mechanical to electrical. The four main power transformers have also been upgraded in capacity and now have a forced air oil cooling system that is more environmentally friendly than the originals, which used water to cool the oil and potentially could have caused oil to be mixed with the water supply downstream. To rehab all of our generators, turbines, and the transformers. We should be completed by the year of 2007. 
and it'll probably be another 50 to 60 years before any of this work is done again. So that's how we make electric power. I hope you've enjoyed exploring the dam.